as we now move into understanding the principles of virus construction, um, we'll go back to this idea that we brought up initially, and that is symmetry. Symmetry is the key to building virus particles because, in general, their genomes aren't so big. They can't encode a lot of proteins, so they have to use genetic economy, which means they have to repeat subunits over and over. Now, all of this came about really beginning uh, with the work of Watson and Crick. Now, you, you may know Watson and Crick as having figured out the structure of DNA in 1953, but in fact, they made a huge contribution to uh, our understanding of virus structure. Back in 1956, so they had, they had figured out the structure of DNA, they moved on to other things. They uh, wrote a paper in which they said, you know, uh, most of the viruses that we look at under the EM, so all the data we had so far was from EM, they're either spherical or they're rod-shaped. So here we have a spherical poliovirus particle down there on the table in gray. And a, a rod-shaped particle would be like tobacco mosaic virus, right? So of all the EMs of viruses that had been done, they pretty much fell into those two categories. And they also knew by, from biochemical studies that had been done, that is you purify a virus, you break it up, you run it on a protein gel, and you count how many proteins are present, that the viruses are made with many copies of a few proteins. So let's say you purified poliovirus, and you broke it up and you ran it on a protein gel. You would find four proteins. And their molar amounts would tell you that they are repeated many times uh, to form the virus particle. Finally, they reasoned that um, viral proteins must have properties, structural properties, which are unique to virus structural proteins that allow them to interact with each other in a symmetrical way. Okay, so those three points they made. And from their work, what we know now is that uh, what, how viruses are built are using two kinds of symmetry, either helical symmetry for rod-shaped viruses or polyhedral symmetry for round viruses, and we'll talk about this in, in detail in a moment. So you take identical protein subunits and you repeat them many times, either in a helical fashion or in, an, in a, a polyhedral fashion. So that's what Watson and Crick uh, gave to structural virology. And from their work, there came these rules of symmetry, which tell you how to make a virus particle. And there are just two rules. The first rule is that each subunit in the particle has identical bonding with its neighbors. So if you have two proteins, the same protein repeated twice, the interactions of those two proteins will be the same no matter where you are in the virus particle. So identical bonding. And this gives you a symmetrical arrangement of, of proteins in the capsid. You repeat the same subunit over and over. You have in identical rea uh, interactions throughout the particle. Gives you a symmetrical particle. All right, so identical bonding contacts. Rule two, the contacts are typically non-covalent. And that means it's, it can be a reversible reaction, which you need on encoding. But maybe even more importantly, or as importantly, while you are assembling a particle, if it's not assembling properly, you can disassemble it and redo it. And there, there are quality control measures that uh, are carried out during infection that monitor this and that tell you, oh, this capsid isn't put together right, let's disassemble it. So that you can do that because the bonds are non-covalent. Right? So those are the two symmetry rules for building particles. Now these symmetry rules we're going to talk about in a moment, but they have turned out to be practically useful for us. They're great for viruses, of course, because viruses build capsids that allow them to transport genomes. But we have taken advantage of this to make vaccines. Uh, so for example, we found out that if you, let's say a virus is made from one capsid protein. Uh, the human papillomaviruses are made from one capsid protein. You can express that capsid protein by itself in a cell and it will assemble into virus proteins. That is because once the protein is made in the cell, it folds in a certain way that is made to interact with, with like proteins. So it finds uh, similar proteins in the cell, they all interact with one another, and they form a shell. So we call these virus-like particles because they only have protein, they don't contain any nucleic acid. 
And you can imagine that for a vaccine, this might be useful. If you don't have nucleic acid present, it's not going to be infectious, yet it will be immunogenic. So the, the hepatitis B virus vaccines and the human papillomavirus vaccines that are made and sold today are made up of uh, uh, virus-like particles, either in yeast or in other cell systems. And again, that's because all the information for making the particle is embodied in the protein. You make one protein, it will then fold properly and assemble with all other versions of itself to form uh, a particle. All right, so back to the two kinds of symmetry by which virions are built. The first one is helical symmetry. And this is a, a simple way of building a particle. You typically take one kind of structural protein, and that protein interacts with other versions of itself uh, and forms a long structure like the ones that are shown here. So typically, the, the protein subunits are called coat proteins, and they interact with each other in identical ways, and they also interact with the viral genome. So here on the top is what the tobacco mosaic virus capsid looks like. It is a rod-shaped structure, as you've seen from a couple of the EMs that I've shown you. And it's composed of a single coat protein repeated many times that binds to the RNA in a helical fashion. You can see here it's twisting around and continues down the rod. And the protein is interacting with the RNA and each subunit interacts with its neighbors in exactly the same way as well. So that gives you symmetry, and the particular kind of symmetry is helical because these structures twist around uh, in a helical fashion. So that's tobacco mosaic virus. Uh, here's an EM of it again, just to remind you. Uh, these are just, these are really naked uh, RNAs with the protein twisted around it, and that's how they infect plants. Now, there are versions of these viruses, or this kind of helical structure in viruses that infect animals. Here's an example of that. Sendai virus is a paramyxovirus related to measles virus. Uh, its nucleocapsid is also made up of a single protein, again, that interacts with itself and with the RNA. This is a bit longer than the TMV capsid. And this would, by the way, be called a nucleocapsid, both of these because the RNA and protein interaction. Now, uh, here on the lower right is a photograph of a measles virus particle. And again, this is related to Sendai. The measles virus nucleocapsid is helical as well. And you can see this virus particle is broken. So the dye, the EM dye, has been able to get into the particle and it's staining the nucleocapsids here. So you can see these are these helical structures just like those uh, shown here. And this is the rabies virus or a, a relative of rabies vesicular stomatitis virus nucleocapsid. Again, a single protein arranged in a helical fashion with the viral RNA inside. Now, the animal viruses that have helical nucleocapsids all are enveloped, at least the ones we know of. So these are not existing naked in the environment, as is TMV. Uh, these nucleocapsids would have an envelope around them. Now, this is, again, the um, helical tobacco mosaic virus. And if you've ever seen these buckyballs, which unfortunately you can't buy anymore, but they are, they're little magnetic balls. And someone gave these to me uh, a long time ago. And a couple of years ago, your TA Ashley was sitting in my office and she was looking at them. She said, do you know you can build a helical nucleocapsid with these? I said, no. And so you can, in fact, and that's shown here. So this is a nice strand of magnets, but you could look at each one of them as a capsid subunit. They're all identical, and they're all interacting with each other in identical manners. And this forms a perfect tobacco mosaic virus, if you will. The only thing missing, of course, uh, is the viral RNA. And the way this assembles is probably the way the capsid would assemble in cells. The proteins form a, a long strand bound to the RNA that then coils up. Uh, into the structure. So it's really neat, uh, and I have this to this day on my desk, and it's always sitting right there and never fair. Whoever sits there starts playing with it and disassembles and reassembles it. It's really, uh, really quite addictive, but it's, it illustrates this principle of helical symmetry very nicely. Now, this is a molecular view of a nucleocapsid of a, a vesicular stomatitis virus shown up here, again, related to rabies virus. Again, these are 
uh, viral RNA complexed with the uh, nuclear protein forming a helical structure. It's opened up a little bit in this diagram, but it would be very tight as shown in the previous uh, movie. And that whole thing is surrounded by an envelope, uh, which in turn is full of glycoproteins. We'll talk about that in a moment. So the, the protein, again, that makes up the subunit of this nuclear capsid is called the anter nuclear capsid protein. Here's the structure of it. And this is the X-ray structure of the protein bound to a short RNA of nine nucleotides. So you can see this N protein binds a very specific sequence. Uh, I should say it binds RNA in a very specific part of the protein. The RNA interaction is actually not sequence specific. And that's why these can coat the entire genome. But what happens is when you put multiple of these N protein molecules together, you see in this structure on the left, they've begun to form a helical structure. It's the first circle. Here is an RNA inside this green molecule, and each uh, N protein is binding a, an adjacent part of the RNA. So that's how these nucleocapsids form. So here are some examples of viruses that infect uh, animals that have helical nucleocapsids. Right? So remember, these all have an envelope. Inside is the genome, which is bound to one protein in this helical fashion that we've just been talking about. Uh, so, for example, measles virus and rabies virus, even influenza virus and the Ebola virus here. All of their genomes are arranged as a nucleocapsid with helical symmetry, and it's packaged uh, within the envelope virus particle. So, as I said before, none of the animal viruses with helical symmetry have naked helical genomes. They all have an envelope around them. 